recovering learnaholic. I just made that up. I like making up words. Um, and I'm very proud of that. And um, Derek's right, I'm very curious. And I also decided to sit down because I've given talks all over the world for years and yet to stand up and all that formal stuff. And I'm doing a lot more teaching with millennials who I think are the most amazing people on the planet. Um, and you sit down and talk to them. So if we could have coffee in here, I am from New Jersey and from New York City. So if we could have coffee in here, <laughs> then we could talk over our coffee. Um, I want to talk to you today about the role of curiosity, the network, and innovation. And it might be a bit circuitous, but that's okay because that's kind of how my mind works. So it'll be fully transparent as to how Deb does or does not think. My mom and my grandparents came over to this country from Eastern Europe to escape the Nazis. They got the last boat that came over. It was stopped by the Germans. All the Jews were taken off except for them, for which we have no idea why that happened, but we are very grateful. About 60 members of my family were killed at Auschwitz. So the um, Frankel book is a very personal one, I guess, for me. And it is one that you guys really, really should read if you want to talk about what's important in life. Um, a few were sent places to escape beforehand. One survived Auschwitz and then was brought over here. And in those days, you needed to be sponsored. I don't know if this is still the case because it's hard to keep up with immigration reform or lack thereof. Um, but you needed to be sponsored by someone here in the States that said, um, we'll vouch for you. You're not going to become a burden on society, et cetera. And so a great aunt had come over earlier, and she sponsored my mom and my grandparents. And likewise, my mom and dad then sponsored my mom's cousin who came over here after being liberated with his family. So I grew up being very grateful for this country, but America was a country. And my family was all over the world. So by that time, given where people had fled to or escaped or whatever, I had family in Israel, which was then called Israel by the time I was born. Yay. Um, <coughs> Budapest, Australia, London, Russia, and the United States. So my family was a network, and it was very clear to me that the network was how you survived because you went to wherever there was someone in the network that would take you in and protect you. So I think from the beginning, I had a kind of global view, which is why, folks, if you are parents, it is an onerous, privileged, honored task but it is onerous, because it starts early. And I believed that the deeper, the broader, and the more diverse your network, the higher your rate of survival. And you can do all the science behind that. So I grew up in New Jersey, New Jersey. <laughs> I grew up on the ocean. I used to say I grew up on the Jersey Shore, but I can't say that anymore now because that TV show. But I grew up on the ocean in New Jersey, not in that Jersey Shore area. Commuting distance from Manhattan, and every Tuesday the museums were free. So my mother took us out of school on Tuesdays, and we went into the city, took the train in, and we went to the Met and the Goog and the MoMA and all that stuff. And then during the week, we'd probably go in on the evening several times for opera, ballet, theater, concerts, you name it. Um, and then we were highly encouraged to stay home on Fridays, too. So we really only went to school. We went to public school three to four days a week. And the superintendent called my parents in because we were missing a heck of a lot of school. To which my father asked, well, what is the average grade? A C. What are my girls getting? A's. To which they, my parents said, it's working. <laughs> Is there anything higher than an A? Because maybe we should pull them out more. Um, <laughs> so that was kind of my whole view of education and the world. And, and being taught that a rounded well person was someone who could take disparate ideas from art, music, science, literature, all over and put them together and combine them to new things. <clears throat> so from there, I went to Brown that 
the, the most conservative of the Ivy League institutions. <laughs> Not. <laughs> um, and I went there because you could do your own thing and create your own concentration. This is 1979. I was 17 years old. We'd had email in high school. At Brown, I had a terminal in my room, a terminal, not a PC, hooked up to the Unix machines in the computer center to do my programming wow. and email my friends from high school. Wow. So, you know, when Jay was talking earlier about in the 90s discovering the web, there were some of us geeks and nerds who didn't know we were nerds, but that's how life was done. And it, then from Brown, I went to Bell Labs. How many people here know what Bell Labs was or is? See, this is what's happening in the world, you guys. So Bell Labs was the think tank R&D lab for AT&T. Uh, the solar cell battery was created there. Cellular technology was created there. The transistor was created there. So much of our world today was created there. And there is a really great case of knowing how to invent but not innovate. So to me, invention, Innovation is invention plus commercialization. Um, and AT&T, Bell Labs, like I said, created cell service. We actually had experiments running of cell service in the 40s and the 60s and the 80s. But because it couldn't be 100% perfect by all the things around innovation, couldn't offer it. So. Later on in 1990-something, AT&T bought McCall for a few billion bucks, who had taken the AT&T Bell Labs technology and commercialized it. Mm. And we probably could have done it a lot mm. cheaper if we'd done it ourselves, but. So at Bell Labs, I'm hanging out with Nobel Prize winners. So Arno Penzias was the Nobel Prize winner who discovered the Big Bang Theory, not the TV show. <laughs> the one it's based off of. Uh, and you could just walk in his office and talk to him and have lunch with him. I would sit in the office on the floor of the guys that invented Unix and security for Unix. I had no idea these were big shots. I was 20 years old and they were just really cool, interesting people. We had behavioral psychologists, economists, chemists, biologists. I ended up marrying a physicist from there. Um, so tons of ideas and thoughts all going around. And my first project that I was hired in for, so at Brown, I'm going to back up a second, I started the cognitive science program at Brown, which looked at how does the brain process information. And then I go to Bell Labs as a systems engineer, never took an engineering class at Brown at all, which I find ironic because I'm also now on the board of the engineering school at Brown and I'm the only non-engineer and boy do we think differently. So I'm a systems engineer and my first project is well, I should probably use this clicker thing. Okay, early 80s, so this is 1982 plus. I'm used to email, I'm at Bell Labs, we're using these things called Usenet and NetNews, which are text-based versions of blogs, instant messaging, and all that kind of stuff today. So we would have conversations, I, for instance, I loved Tolstoy, Dostoyevsky, Chekhov, those guys. And over Usenet and NetNews in 1982, I'd have conversations with people in Russia all over the place about literature, about Mark Rothko, Jackson Pollock, cognitive science, and the stuff I was working on. So the network was an inherent tool of how we learned and discovered 31 years ago. Is that right? Whatever about that. It's a long time. I was so young. <laughs> um, so this whole mixing up the network was just part of how we did things. We did email. That was how we communicated in Bell Labs those days, not so much with corporate AT&T. They still really didn't know what a computer was. We did voice through the network. We were sending images, little movies. I mean, we were sending everything through the network at this time, and it was no big deal to us. We weren't sure how much of a big deal it was to the rest of the world because we really didn't know. We weren't allowed to go out and talk with real customers because, you know, we might pick our nose, we would wear jeans, who knew? We weren't presentable. Finally, we were allowed to. And so my project was to take all these messaging systems that AT&T wanted to have us build, like email, voicemail, um, fax, imaging, et cetera, 
and come out with an offering that would compete with companies like IBM, who still exist, DEC, Wang, et cetera, who don't exist. So that was my job. I was to design the architecture for this stuff. And in my quest of procrastination and laziness, <laughs> I had my inspiration. So in terms of innovation, the lone guy in a lab is a myth. I mean, it does happen sometimes, but not a lot. And I think procrastination and laziness are some of the most underutilized tools for innovation. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm serious, I really am serious. So I procrastinate by hanging out with lots of other people, friends, whatever, in Bell Labs. And since we had a very Google-like atmosphere then, even though we weren't Google, I would, you know, oh, I'm bored during the day, I'll go down to the beach, or I'll do this. So we came and went, and it was through all of that that I realized, okay, we've got, we're sending all this stuff around anyway in the labs. Why do I need to create an architecture for each of these systems? Why don't I just create an envelope, because don't you put things in envelopes and mail them? And in the voice world, you can mail them so fast you don't even hear a delay. Basically, voice, no delay, but it's kind of like mailing bits back and forth. Bits are bits, so if I just create an architecture that's an envelope, and it says who it's to, who it's from, how they might want to get it, how fast it's got to get there, and what it is, and I stick the thing in the envelope and send it, I'm done. That's on awesome. to the next project. And so that's what I did. And basically I learned another very critical lesson which applies to innovation. Politics. The way to get the different product houses to build this architecture, because see now the voicemail folks were going to have to build the same thing as the email folks and it wasn't going to be special or different. Right? Oh my gosh. Was to put their names on the patent. So by putting their names, all the product houses on the patent, they agreed to build it. And this became one of the most lucrative patents for AT&T and Lucent. They made big bucks on it. I got a plaque <laughs> and I got a statue. It was very cool. I still have them. They even got my parents a plaque too. I mean, that's really above and beyond the call of duty. <laughs> so um, I say that somewhat cynically. Um, Really? <laughs> so from there, I start working with clients all over the world. I was like a perk. If you build over 20 or 30 million, you got Deb to help you do strategic planning. Because the way I helped create this was by talking to real live customers. And why do you want this? And why is that a problem? Why, 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 why? The five whys, which are really critical. Then I got asked to come back and help to design the next generation core network which we thought in the early 90s should be an IP internet-based network because bits are bits, they can move all over, it's a lot less expensive to build it, deploy it, switches are, those routers are a lot cheaper than big switches. Did a presentation to the board of AT&T and was told that the, in this world, in their lifetimes, the price of a long distance call would never go to zero. Hmm. And the next day, this team that I was on, we all sold our AT&T stock and our 401k and moved it into other stuff. Eventually I left, and it was through my network again that I found my new career. So using the network, I started my own consulting practice in strategy and innovation. I became a partner in a VC firm, and I started doing some teaching. And it just brought me to a whole different level. But it was moving from the physical network to the virtual network and putting those together. You never know who you're going to meet on and offline that can open up a door for you or somebody near to you. I'm actually on this stage today because of the network. So Dirk and I met at BIF, or somehow through BIF, Business Innovation Factory, you'll meet Saul tonight and tomorrow. And it basically changed my life. So this is how this happened, right? Oy vey. Um, I'm part of a mentoring program at Brown where senior, I have to say this right, senior women, women in their senior year at Brown are mentored by women alumni in business. And I was mentoring this young lady, Sarah, a mechanical engineer, and she was interested in innovation, so I Googled Innovation Providence to see what came up, and up came mm. Business Innovation Factory, this mm. guy named Saul Kaplan. So I called him and said, hi, you don't know me, but yada, yada. He meets with Sarah. I go to my first BIF, and it changed my network. So 
That's my Twitter network before Biff 6, my first Biff. I feel like, oh, my voice Biff. I'm a recovering, I'm a non-recovering learner, and this was my first Biff. Actually, guys, they really do tie together if you think about it. After Biff, and then this past April. So your reaction might be, oh my gosh, look at our network. The issue isn't so much the number, it is the breadth, the depth, and the diversity of your network. Because the broader, the deeper, and the more diverse your network, the more of an impact you can have. It is a proxy for you, and hopefully for you doing good stuff, not, not good stuff. And a network is useless if you don't use it and you don't share it. One of the things I ask my clients to do is to match 10% of my fee and give that away to improve their, someone's lives in their community and to mentor an entrepreneur, the network, to pay it forward. Now, I have been very blessed with an incredible network. It's a mashup of artists, musicians, designers, business people, innovators, scientists, I mean, it's, it's just got almost all walks of life in there, which then lets me combine, recombine, and I think innovation is a lot of recombining, and lets me introduce my clients and the students that I mentor to new people doing cool things. And Matt Lavin, who will be speaking this afternoon, we hope if his flight gets here, um, in full disclosure as a client, and I've been honored to be able to introduce him to really cool people doing really cool things so that there's new technology happening or new solutions to wicked problems. And that is, to me, the purpose of a network. Now, um, lest I be too altruistically sounding, this is an extremely selfish thing on my part. So I get really jazzed and excited about sharing my network because I learn new things when I do that. And it is really cool to be able to see new things happen that wouldn't have happened before directly second, third, fourth order consequences. You never know, you may never know. And to be able to work with these millennials, so I do a lot of stuff up at Brown, in the spirit of being paradoxical or mixing stuff up, I'm also on a board for some stuff at RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design. So a cognitive science with an art and music background is working with the engineers and the designers to create stuff. And that just seems pretty normal. <laughs> and actually, you guys, that is, pretty normal for the millennial generation. And that is why they are so exciting to talk to and so important to bring into your network. So it's by doing that that I just get jazzed, I see cool things happen, and then in turn I benefited from that. So one of my friends, Whitney Johnson, who I think spoke last year, yep. right? Whitney yep. spoke last year. She decided I should be blogging in Harvard Business Review, bless her heart, and so I am. And so because of that then, there was this kid doing really cool things. He was 22 years old, uh, basically an application that goes along with MOOCs, the online university stuff. And he had an article in HBR at the age of 22. Is that like really cool or what? Well, I think it's really cool. You don't? <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> um, one of the other kids that I've worked with, Hannah McPhee, class of 14, has developed a language to translate and have commonality between design thinking and scientists. This is no small feat. It is now being used in negotiations with RISD and other schools. Her thesis advisor is pretty blown away. And a whole new language has been created to allow people from different disciplines to talk to each other. That's the beauty of the network. So my friend Saul, who you will hear about tomorrow, here tomorrow, we'll talk about ruckus. 1939, Bell Labs moves from New York City to New Jersey. Frank Jewett's the president, and he intentionally designs the corridors to be massively long, like quarter of a mile. And off those hallways are gonna be labs of physicists, biologists, chemists, experimental whatevers, economists, everything. It's not like this is the physics wing and this is the biology wing. Because he believed by bringing people together of different walks of life and having them collide, they would create new things. And I believe he was right. So you guys have a great opportunity here to do that. 
And I would ask you, like Dirk did before at the break, to go out there and randomly collide, to go out there and create a ruckus. Thank you.